Hey everybody, welcome back. In this video series, I'm building out a 3D SimCity clone using 3JS. In the last video, I built out a basic toolbar and added the ability to place zones and roads as well as delete them. So what are we trying to accomplish in this video? Our primary focus will be expanding on how we represent buildings in our city data model. Instead of representing buildings as a string on the building ID property of our tiles, will be represented as an object. This will allow us to add additional metadata for each zone and building type, as well as defining unique logic for each zone type to determine how they grow over time. Finally, we'll be able to add some placeholder update methods for our zones, so our buildings will once again be dynamic and grow over time. So the clip I'm showing right now was kind of a demo of that. So let's get to it and write some code. So I'm starting off in the city.js file where we define the data model for our city. So just to recap, we have our initialize function where we initialize our 2D data array. And each element in this array is a tile on our game map. So if I go down to our create tile function, each tile in our data model has its X and Y coordinates, the terrain ID. So this is what type of terrain to render at that location and also the ID of the building at that location. So that'd be residential, commercial, industrial, and so forth. And then we have an update method for that. So we're gonna be expanding on this part a bit. I'm gonna start by replacing building ID with an object called building. This object will contain metadata specific to the building on this tile, and also allow us to define specific logic for each zone and building type. So I'm gonna create a new file. I'm going to call this buildings.js. And in here, I'm just going to create a new object. That's going to be my only export. And this object is going to be a factory of sorts. And by that, I mean it's going to contain a bunch of functions that I can call that will create my building objects. So I've started by creating some placeholder factory functions for each of our different building types that we have so far. So note that the building ID is now a property on our building object. Let's go ahead and replace the building ID property on our tile object with building. And this will eventually point to the building object. And then I've defined some placeholder update functions. So we can remove that on our tile because that will now be defined on the building itself. So going up to the update function for our city, as we iterate through each tile, we've moved this inside of the building. So we're going to call that here. And we might not have a building object for this particular tile. So we use the optional operator to make sure that we don't call the update method on an undefined object. So the next thing that we'll need to do is to make updates to both the scene and the game to reflect the changes that we've made to our tile object. So first off, let's just jump into the scene here. In our update method, we're referencing building ID. Let's replace with a, this with building dot ID. Make sure to use the optional chaining operator here. So if building is undefined, then we don't try and access the ID. It'll just set new building ID to undefined. In addition, we need to go into game. So if we're bulldozing a tile, then we want to remove the building completely. So we'll just set the building object to undefined in that case. And then right here, we need to actually instantiate one of these building objects that we've defined in our buildings file. So I'm going to import our file. I'm going to call this building factory. And then our building will be set equal to building factory. And remember that this is an object that contains a bunch of factory functions. So we can access those via this string here. And that string is actually gonna be our tool ID. And we'll evaluate that. So how this works is if, let's say we have the residential tool selected, we click on a tile, it's gonna call this method, and it's gonna call this branch of our if statement and it's going to set the building equal to this expression here. So it's going to access the property of our building factory with the active tool ID. 
So that would be residential here, and that's going to return our factory function. So if we call that function, then it's going to return a new instance of that residential zone object. So we need to change this to dot building instead of dot building ID. All right, so I think we've made all the necessary adjustments to handle our change to using the building object. Let's go to our game and make sure everything's still working. And it looks like our zones are still appearing. So it looks like with commercial selected, it's still laying down residential zones. Probably set the wrong identifiers on our buildings. And sure enough, all of these are set to residential. I'm sure you're probably screaming at the monitor trying to tell me that was wrong. That's one of the disadvantages of doing this all on the fly. Sometimes it makes some mistakes here, but that's all right. We'll figure them out. All right, jumping back in, lay down some residential buildings, commercial buildings. Now they're blue. And we get industrial and the roads. Okay, so I think we're back to status quo here. Everything's still the same, but now in our city data model, we now have our buildings represented as objects rather than just using a string identifier. So now we can go in and start fleshing out some logic here so we can have these buildings grow and develop over time. So for our building update logic, I'm just going to kind of replicate what we did before. Each step in the simulation, there's going to be a random chance of the building growing over time. And like I've been saying, eventually we're going to define some you know, more interesting models for this that take into account like crime and pollution and road access and access to power. But for now, we're just trying to make sure that we can set up the structure. So I'm going to implement some update functions for each of these. And I'll meet you on the other side. All right, so I've gone ahead and added some basic logic for the update methods for each building. So all this does is what we had before. There's a 1% chance that in each step in the simulation, the building height can increase by one up to a maximum of five. So also note that I replaced the arrow functions with an actual function declaration here. And the reason for this, if we're looking at the MDN documentation for arrow functions, arrow functions do not have their own bindings to this. And they should not be used as methods. That was an oopsie on my part. When we're trying to access the height of our residential building object, or any other object for that matter, if you use an arrow function, this will not evaluate correctly. So we need to use this function syntax instead. So now that we have our update logic laid out, we need to update our assets, our 3D models, so that as this height property changes over time, the assets will kind of stretch to show that change in height. So if you look at our assets right now, you can see that when we create an asset instance, we don't have any way of passing in the height of the building. Because eventually we need to you know, pass that height in to each of these functions here, and then we need to scale the mesh by that height value. So how I'm going to approach this is I'm going to add a, a new argument to our create asset instance function here. I'm just going to call that data. So this is going to be an object. This is going to be additional metadata needed for creating the asset. And then we'll pass this in. And then we'll add a data argument to each of our asset factory functions where it's needed. So that'd be our residential zone, our commercial zone, and our industrial zone. So the grass asset and the road asset, those are static. They don't need any additional metadata. They just need to know where they're going to be positioned. But our residential, commercial, industrial zones are going to need the, the height of the buildings so they can scale that mesh appropriately. So I'm going to approach this very simply. I'm just going to pass the entire building object in when I create the asset instance. Let's go into our scene. And in our update method here, when we're creating the asset instance, we're just going to pass in the entire building. Okay, there we go. So now we need to update our asset factory functions to 
use the height property on this data to scale the mesh. I'm going to go ahead and do that. Okay, so for each of our zone types, we're going to scale the mesh by the height property on our data. Then we're going to pos position the mesh appropriately so it's the correct height off of the terrain. So the last thing that we need to address is our logic for when we need to update a mesh. Currently, we're looking at when the building ID changes. However, let's say our building changes height. The building ID will remain unchanged, so we won't know to go create the new taller asset. So what I'm going to do is add a new Boolean property to each of our buildings called updated. So whenever the state of the building is updated and it requires a new mesh to be created, we're going to set updated to true. So in our update functions, after we update the height, we want to set updated to true. So I'm going to update the other building factory functions as well. So notice that I'm setting updated to true immediately, right when the building is created. So this is going to tell our scene right away to go ahead and look at our asset library and pull in a mesh. So even for the road as well, we're going to need updated set to true. So in our update function, we're going to set this to false. Because once we place the road down, we go and pull the mesh for it. We pull that into the scene. We don't need to update that mesh ever again. So this is just going to be permanently false. So now we need to go into our scene to handle this new updated property. So we're going to need to rework all of the logic in this function. Right now we're looking at ID. That's not really what we need anymore. So we can actually just get rid of this part completely. We're just going to look at the, the building objects themselves. So if a player removes a building, then we need to remove it from the scene. So in that case, that's going to mean that new building is undefined. And we have a current building in the scene. So this part will remain unchanged because we're just removing the mesh from the scene and then setting our mesh array at those x and y coordinates to undefined. And looking at this, I don't really like this terminology here. You know, new building versus current building. What I really want is you know, the, the building in our data model versus the building in our scene. So I'm going to delete this line and define a new variable called tile. So I renamed current building to existing building mesh. It's a bit more descriptive. We'll replace current building with that. And then we'll replace that. I think that's a bit more descriptive and easier to read. So if we don't have a building on our tile and we have an existing building mesh, then we'll remove that mesh from the scene. We need to change this logic as well. So if our tile has a building and that building has been updated, then we need to remove the existing building mesh. And then we need to create our new asset instance. So this is going to be tile.building. And then we're going to add the new building to the scene. So after we've updated the scene to reflect the new changes on our tile, and we can go ahead and set the updated property on our building to false. So that won't try and update that building again until our building update function changes the height and sets updated back to true. All right, so that was a lot of code. Let's go and look at our game and see if everything is still working. And let's see if our buildings grow over time. A new building ID is not defined. It looks like I missed one. Let's go back to line 60 in our scene. And sure enough, this should be tile.building.id. All right, so I went ahead and laid down some zones, and it looks like our code is now working. Our zones are developing and growing over time, which is awesome. It's starting to feel like a real city. So to recap what we've done in this video, we replaced the building ID property on our tiles with a building object. We created factory functions for our different building types. And then we updated the rest of our code to accommodate these changes.
This included being able to pass in additional building metadata when creating our 3D assets, as well as reworking the logic for when a building is updated and its mesh needs to be replaced. So my last two videos have been a bit heavy on logic, so I thought in the next video, we'll take a break from this for a while and we'll focus on improving the visuals of our city and some other quality of life features that I have thought of. And of course, if you're enjoying this video series, be sure to hit the like and subscribe buttons below. If people are really engaged in this series, then it, then it really encourages me to keep going. And I, I certainly appreciate all the positive feedback so far. So until next time, take care, everyone.